public versus private. Where are we at with this? Where are you at with this? Do you know what that is? Do you know what it means? Let's find out. Welcome to For the Quantum Grammar Shoot Podcast. The only podcast of its kind that I'm aware of on the interwebs. It's a podcast where I, your host, Colin Jason Knife and Matthew Colin Glass, you can call me Jason, will take a look at various topics as viewed through the lens of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. The wonderful grammar technology brought to the public in 1988 by the late colon David Eifenwin, colon Miller. Full stop. So public versus private. This was brought to my attention by a commenter who goes by the YouTube handle of, I think it's nobody's business or something like that, which is uh, in some ways an ironic YouTube handle because when you click on that uh, username, their full correct name comes up. (laughs) So I did post a short video as Kuliana to this individual's uh, comment. But the gist of the comment was this. Uh, Well, it was in response to a video I did where I was just wondering aloud for 60 seconds why folks who email me don't include their full correct name at the bottom of their email, i.e., they do not take authority over their words, or they just include a first name. Assuming, I guess, that we're on a friendly basis, which we are not, we're strangers. We are not friends, we are strangers. You can be strangers, then you can get acquainted and familiar, but friendship is a completely different vessel, all right? I don't have very many friends. That's a very special venue, a special domain for me. Anyways, most folks I communicate with are in the fiction what we would call acquaintances, okay? So that's an assumption presumption on the email author's part. But the point I'm making here is very few people express the volition to take authority over their words, meaning they don't want to put their full correct name, even on YouTube, to the comment I was responding to. That individual uses a nom de guerre. And, you know, I understand that. I was the same way many years ago when I was younger and a little bit immature. It's like, you don't need to know who I am. I can say whatever I want to. I control whoever I want to. I can use whatever words I want to and not be held accountable because I'm not using my correct name. I'm using a YouTube handle. And I had various internet Nom de guerres. But there you go. That is the solidity of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. If you create a claim of the live life with the correct postal mechanics, correct banking mechanics, correct flag mechanics, and most importantly, correct grammar mechanics, and also correct witnessing mechanics, Then you create your name as a fact. And now you are held to a different standard than everyone else on earth who does not have a live life claim. You are held to the standard of a fact because you have been certified as a fact by the witnesses on your live life claim. So now... You are basically held to, as I said, a different standard. Your feet are put to the fire. 
you're up on the carpet now, you're in the spotlight, you have to stand by what you say. No more weekend keyboard warrior bullshit. If you say something, you better be able to back it up. And that's the way I navigate and the way I've been navigating for the past seven years using this wonderful grammar technology. I understand. I cognize that most folks out there in worldwide web land do not possess this type of volition. They're scared. They're afraid. They don't want their what they can strew or what they cognize to be their name. They don't want it out there in the public because they feel like it's nobody's business. You don't need to know what my name is. I can talk and say whatever the hell I want to you, but you don't need to know my name. I can say all kinds of egregious, nasty, rude things to you, and you can't do nothing about it because you don't know who I am. You don't know where I live, so on and so forth. Guess what? With correct sentence structure, it doesn't work that way. I apologize for the extraneous noise. There's a cleanup crew outside of uh, my domicile getting rid of the leaves and the garbage and whatnot. Which is what I'm doing here, basically. Because I'm speaking to those folks who are serious about navigating using the domain of fact rather than the uh, domain of fiction. If you're into using nom de guerres and that's your main focus in your navigations on the internet, then you are firmly entrenched in the domain of fiction. That's fiction mentality. For example, one example that just popped into my head that I will share with you is the water bill that comes to my domicile. It's addressed to occupant. It never has anyone's adjective, adjective, pronoun name on it. It just has occupant, which, if you're familiar with quantum grammar mechanics, is no contract because it's a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word. Yes, I know some folks will say, well, don't you mean a vowel in front of two consonants? No, a vowel in front of one consonant, a vowel in front of two consonants, a vowel in front of three consonants, four consonants, five consonants, doesn't matter. It's all no contract if it's a vowel followed by a consonant at the beginning of a word. So I take my water bill down to the township building. And I address the, I guess you would call them a cashier at the desk. I slide the the envelope over to her. And I show her the word occupant. And I say, who is that? What does that mean? And then she looks at me like I'm stupid and says, well, whoever is occupying the house. So... Okay, you mean whoever is in the house or living there or residing there? She's like, yeah. Okay, so I'm there. My wife's there. We have a few dogs. We have a few cats. We have a bird. Those are all occupants, aren't they? And then she looks at me. (laughs) and She's like, well... I said, well, I don't see a name there. This is not specific. So I need to know what this word means. If this bill came from you, this entity that you represent, do you know what the words mean that you're using on this bill, i.e. this contract? Because me, as another contract party, and this is the terms and conditions coming from you, I need to know what they mean. And I need to know that you know what they mean. So what do they mean? 
So she's like, oh, well, I'm, I have to get a supervisor. So then a supervisor comes over. And they think there's an issue. And I pull out my checkbook. I was like, well, I'm here to pay this bill. You know, I wanted to make it clear that I wasn't there to create issues or hardships. And they weren't really doing anything anyways. They were just kind of talking amongst themselves, drinking their coffee, eating their croissants or whatever they were doing. So I wasn't really, I wasn't there to make anyone's life harder than it needed to be. I just want to know what the word occupant means, what they mean by it, when they address this to me or to my household, to my domicile. The supervisor didn't know either. And then I brought it to her attention that, well, do you mean it like they mean when, you know, the U.S. occupies Afghanistan or Iraq? Because if you look it up in an etymology dictionary, it, you know, it has military connotations. Why are you using this word? What does it mean? Who in the hell is this addressed to? And the look in her eyes was one of total deer in the headlights type of scenario. And she said, well, I'm going to have to call. And I just cut her off. I said, ah, that's not a big deal. And I wrote the check out and, uh, and left. And left it at that. So, before you make the assumption, presumption that those folks at the banks or at the township building or anywhere else or even at the courts know what it is they're doing, keep this in mind. They probably don't. They're probably just doing what they're told. And the folks that do know what they're doing are very, very far above them and very hard to get a hold of. So just keep that in mind with the balance of the honor and the grace. So to get back to what I was saying about public and private, what I did there was in the public, obviously. Going in there, talking to them, it is not a private venue. It is a public venue. So, to talk about public versus private, in the private would be something that happens maybe inside of your house or in the domain of your email address, even through the post office box. But in the post office box, what is private is not the post office box. Actually, literally, but what is inside the envelope inside the post office box. Now, of course, you can't go around. It's a federal offense to open someone else's post office box or their mailbox and look inside. That is a federal offense. And uh, you could be sanctioned for that. But more importantly, it's what's inside the envelope that has the postage stamp on it that is the issue. That's the way I look at it. What is confidential, what is private, is what is dictated by the authority of that venue. So if I say my email is confidential, then it is. If I say this particular communication that I'm having with you is confidential, then it is. If you say, no, it's not, well, then we're going to stop communicating. Do you see what I'm saying here? So... We can say that a YouTube channel comments field is public. So it is. Anyone can see it. But now, if you have a membership on that YouTube channel, that can provide a domain of confidentiality, confidential to the members who agree to the terms and conditions to participate there. That can be confidential. If I ask you to meet me in my front yard and have a conversation and say it's confidential between you and I, then it is confidential. Anyone listening in is violating those terms and conditions because they're not a part of the contract. Do you see what I'm saying here? So to bring it back to the original 
comment that I'm sharing Kuliana on, that individual quite obviously does not know the difference between private and confidential. Now here's a caveat to that. If we're in the confidential and you begin threatening me or giving me the sensation that you're going to do me harm or about to do me harm or you're being rude, you're being aggressive, confrontational, malicious, bullying, well, that breaks confidentiality. The confidentiality is off the table then. Because keep in mind, it's always the three principles, the balance of the honor and the grace, the position of peace and neutrality, and the maintenance of rule one rule equal. Once you violate those things, confidentiality is off the table. Now, we're going to go and I'm going to hit you with everything I have if I need to. I don't have a problem with that. Because I know what the line is between public and private. And I know what those terms and conditions are. And it's very logical, folks. It's no secret. It's, there's no mysticism to it or anything like that. You can look at any court case. You can look at what they call in the fiction non-disclosure agreements or whatever you <laughs> want to call them. NDAs, which are pretty ridiculous. But you can see, you can learn all you need to learn about it right there. People sign those every day, but yet they don't understand what they mean. And then you have a whistleblower. And that comes in when there's harm being done. Do you see what I'm saying? I hope this is like uh, setting some light bulbs off in your heads. NDAs can be logically and reasonably nullified if there's harm being done. Because what is the, the first and foremost rule in life? Do no harm. Because everything is taught in a negative condition of state. Thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that, blah, blah, blah. Or to put it, put it in a positive performance condition of state, maintenance of rule one, rule equal. Position of peace and neutrality. Balance of honor and grace. It's that simple, folks. That's the difference between public and private. It's all about you and your volition. Bringing it back to uh, volition. Volition is the most important thing. What is your intent? Is your volition to screw somebody over? Is it your volition to trick someone? Well, if that's the case, then confidentiality isn't really going to apply when your volition becomes apparent to the other contract party. And it should not apply. Because we're talking about the balance of the honor and the grace. And you have broken the honorable part of that. So that's why I use that comment as an example and tag them in it and put it out there in the public. So hopefully, with cultivation of humility, they will learn something from that. And hopefully, maybe, they will be inspired and motivated to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, which that particular commenter has shown no evidence of any knowledge of at all. But I do appreciate you listening to this. And if you have any questions, if you want to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, you can email me in the confidential at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com. Please include your full correct name. And keep in mind, it is confidential. So I will not use any of your email, anything you say to me, or your name, in the public. Thank you.
Thank you.